Def tick talk. Tick equals lambda talk plus one. Wall talk minus tick less than five. Talk equals tick plus one. Well, I guess I'm feeling the first question. <laughs> Quick background too. Our midterms aren't exactly easy. I remember my first midterm, the average of the class was like a 50%. So I haven't touched this shit in like three years. So I might be a little bit rusty. And now it's finished work. It's supposed to be chilling, but y'all want to see this, so got you. And I have a PDF of this on my iPad, so I'm just gonna be doing it with my magic pencil too. All right guys, and before we start the midterm, I just want to quickly thank MakerWatch for sponsoring today's video. I really like this sponsorship because I know a lot of y'all are computer science students, people interested in software engineering, and MakerWatch is actually asking me to help them find someone to fill a software development position they're hiring for. A little bit about the company, MakerWatch is a tech startup that sponsors hundreds of creators, just like me, every month on behalf of amazing brands. And they work with creators in more than 56 countries. They're backed by Y Combinator, which if you don't know, is literally the most prestigious startup accelerator in Silicon Valley, and they're focusing on scaling influencer marketing through disruptive technology. So MakerWatch is looking right now for a back-end software engineer to join their team in order to help them speed up these scaling efforts. MakerWatch is also fully remote, so even once coronavirus shelter in place ends soon, you'll still be able to work from the comfort of your home with team members in six different countries. So if you are interested in this career opportunity, make sure to click the link down below. MakerWatch will basically know that I referred you for this position and apply before someone else gets the job. And just like a personal side note too, I know with all this coronavirus craziness, you know, wave two coming, a lot of companies, they're not hiring right now. It's hard to get internships. A lot of offers are getting pulled. So I'm seriously really happy to be able to partner with MakerWatch for this video. I generally hope that one of y'all might viewers gets this position. Once again, thank you so much to MakerWatch for sponsoring today's video and let's do this midterm. So the first question, it's kind of tricky. They want to test your understanding of how the computer evaluates and reads code. You know, you can write a shit ton of code and your input and output will be expected, but they want to make sure you understand the underlying low level actions that are going on with Python in this case. So I'm probably going to fail this, but let's try this. For each of the expressions in the table below, write the output displayed by the interactive Python interpreter when the expression is evaluated. The output may have multiple lines. If an error occurs, write error, but include all output displayed before the error. If the evaluation would run forever, write forever. See, a lot of things are tricky. To display a function, write function. The first two rows have been provided as example. And then the interactive interpreter displays a value of successfully evaluated expressions, otherwise it's none, and you execute statements on the left. And we'll see this on a screen. So for the first example, we can see that how 10 to, what does that mean? You just do 10 to the power of two, so that's why you get 100. Next question, print four, five, plus one. So when you read left to right, you evaluate the print function, so you would see four and five. And then the plus one, you can't add one to a print statement, so you would get an error. So that'll be the second line. And that's what we see here. So kind of easy, right? But it's about to get kind of wild. So let's see. Print, print 2020. Well, uh, I guess I'm feeling the first question. Let's see. So we go from left to right. And then if you print a print, pretty sure you get an error. I want to try this though. And then what do you get returned from a print print? This would give you error. So then we're calling error of 2020. I'm just going to assume that's another error. That's going to be my answer. I hope that's right. Let me just double check one more time. Print takes in a value and we want to print on the screen, but print is non-defined. Oh, you know what? I'm stupid. It's not that. If we print what print literally is, it will be like function. And that's just like how it's mentioned here um, to display a function value, right? Function. So sometimes they have hints like that. I think that's the answer for the first part so we print the value of what print is which is a function and after that we get the resulting value of this call and call it with 2020 so what is the resulting value of this call it is a function which is print so we're actually printing 2020 so i think that's the actual answer if i was right on the first time then i just lost two points next question tick 50. so tick is an actual function to find but we can see on the left side here we have a function called tick talk and there's a lot of shit inside that we have to worry about what is talk in this case? It's 50. So tick equals lambda, which is a function which returns you plus one. So I can just write down inside the function tick equals function that returns talk plus one. What is talk? It's 50 in this case. So talk plus one. And then we have a while loop. While talk minus tick is less than five, we do this. So what is talk minus tick? So talk minus tick is 50, 50 minus this function call. So with this parameters, it means we call this function. So while 50 minus 50 plus one, 50 minus 50 plus one. That, this is the resulting value when you call a uh, tick because it's a lambda one, which equals negative 51. So then we're still in this while loop because negative 
51 is less than five, right? So then talk equals tick plus one. So now talk equals, so it's 51 plus one. So then talk is now 52. So I'll update this value. So it's talk equals 52. And then if talk is greater than 100, we return tick. Talk is not greater than 100. So we can go to the next iteration of the while loop. And usually with these while loops, there's going to be a pattern eventually. So hopefully I can find it soon or else I have to write a lot of iterations. So now 52 minus 52 plus one is 53. So negative one. So negative one is still less than the negative five. So let me take that out. So it's negative one plus five. So then talk is now equal to tick. So that's 53. Three plus one is 54. Now talk is 54. I think I already see the pattern now. This is not too bad. 54 is not greater than 100, so we exit out. So then one more time. So what it's talk minus tick. So 54 minus 54 plus one. That's just going to be negative one. Negative one is still going to be less than five. And then now we do talk equals tick plus one. So talk equals 54 plus one plus one. And now talk equals 56. So we see this pattern. Basically in this iteration, the while loop here, it'll always equal negative one. But each time we do this iteration, talk is increasing by two. First talk was 50, then it was 52, then it was 54, now it's 56. So each time we do one iteration of the while loop, talk increases by two. With that in mind, we exit this while loop in two cases. Either in the outside where talk minus tick call is less than five, or if talk is greater than 100, we return tick. So we know we won't exit the while loop on the outside because it's always going to be negative one. So we're only going to exit when we hit this if case. So if talk is greater than 100, we know talk is going to be 102, not 101, because talk is incrementing by two each iteration. So it won't stop off when talk equals 100. It has to wait when it's greater than 100. So next iteration, it'll be talk equals to 102. So when talk equals 102, we return tick. And what is tick? Tick is still the lambda where you return talk plus one. Tick is never changed in this case. We're only changing talk. So tick equals a function that returns talk plus one. But since we're calling it with this parentheses right here, here, we're evaluating that function, so we return talk plus one, which is going to be 103, because we know talk is 102. Next question. Oh, so now we're going from Snapchat instead of TikTok, another one of my favorite apps to waste my time on. <laughs> Uh, chat 2020, so so this means this is that, and this means this is that. When you're calling this snap here, you still have to reference the snap above because the snap on the left side here has not been defined yet. Snap now equals print and chat equals snap 20 of the prior snap definition. Chat equals snap 2020, so if I call chat 2020, we're calling snap of 20, 20, 20, 20. So this snap is referencing this snap right here. So let's look at what's gonna happen. So what is chat in this case? Chat equals 2020. And then it returns a function that takes lambda and then calls snapchat. So now we're returning a function that takes in a value and then returns snapchat. But notice how this lambda doesn't take in any parameters. So you can think of it as that is equivalent to this part of the body. So then you move this in here, 20, 20. So we have this lambda function that was defined and now we're calling it with the parameter 2020. But like I said, this lambda doesn't take any parameters. So it doesn't matter what we feed it here. All we do is return snap of 2020. So the resulting answer should just be snap of 2020. But then the tricky case is which snap are we using? So now snap is actually defined to be this snap, I'm pretty sure. And we associate it with print. So I think we were just calling print of 2020. Because remember, with this box here up top, we fed it 2020 here, but it doesn't matter what the parameter was. All we do is return snap of 2020 and snap of 2020, this snap was defined here. So we're actually just calling the print 2020. And maybe I got this question wrong, but that's what I think. So I think we just print 2020. Now we call chat. So chat, we know we already defined it here as snap 2020. So now I can think of it as what is here is the same thing as this. So we first want to evaluate snap of 2020. So we're going to print 2020 again, because remember snap is defined as print. And then after that, what does print 2020 return? It returns nothing because a print value returns nothing on just pr prints the value on the screen, replaces none. And then now we're calling none parentheses. And I think that gives you an error because this parentheses means it's a function call, but none is not defined as a function. Pretty sure it's an error. Next question, so we're calling Q of 20. So in this case, we know Q equals 20. If print Q, Q. So if you go to this if case, you have to do what is, since you're evaluating that if clause, and inside that clause, there's a print function, you actually have to evaluate that print. So we're going to evaluate print of 2020. I think that gives you 
I don't know if that gives you an error to be honest. Oh, it doesn't. So you can just print two values and it goes like that. So 20 and then 20. So if 20, 20. So remember, what does a print value return? It returns none. And none evaluates as false, I think, on Python. So this statement is false and not true. So we do not execute this print. Next question, if Q. So what is Q? Q is 20. So 20, I think in Python, numbers that aren't zero evaluate as true. So we do execute this body. So now we know Q equals 20 plus 20. Sorry, I should have written this out. So now Q equals 40. So now if Q is greater than zero, that's true. We want to return Q. So then we return 40. And then do we execute this print? We don't because once you do a return in a function call, you exit out of that block. So you're done with that function. You don't evaluate anything underneath. But I think that's about it. And let's check my answers now. So the solutions are also online too. So I'm just looking at my computer screen and then I'll put these in the link in the description too, so you can see. The first question, print, print 2020, interactive output is function error. Shit, so we got that wrong. Oh my God. Tick 50 is 103, so we got that correct. Chat 2020 is an error. Oh my God, I got that wrong. <laughs> and then chat, we get 2020 and then no error. Okay, so I got that wrong, I got extraneous. And then Q20, we got 20, 20, and 40. So I got that right. Okay, so this one's two points. So I missed half, so it's minus one. And then this one is one point, so I got minus one. Then this one is one point, I missed half, or I had extraneous, so I would say minus 0 0.5. So for this question, we missed 2.5 points, and the entire question is eight points. So not too bad. It's a 5.5 out of eight. Okay, I mean, I can take that. Honestly, y'all can figure out why I got this error. I'm going to go to the next question. So this is a question that we always usually do. It's called an environment diagram. Previously, I was kind of like making my own environment diagrams. It's where you like keep track of all the variables and their values and you point to like sometimes let's say variables assigned to a list. So I would draw out the list and then point to it. And then in this case, like they're just going more ham. They're not even checking if you get the correct value or the correct result of the function call. They also want to make sure that you know each step, each frame, what's going on. So these ones are really hard too. I remember practicing these a lot when I was a freshman. Fill in the environment diagram, blah, 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 blah. You may not use all of the spaces or frames. So it's tricky too, just cause you have like three things here, doesn't mean you have to use all of them. And then add all missing values created a reference during execution. And then the code we're looking at is right here. So we're creating an environment diagram based on this function and then all these calls right here. And then we wanna show the return value for each local frame. So cross out or erase all arrows and values that are not part of the final diagram. So we have this function people. So that's the original global frame. Global frame is like the original starting like function stack. Everything in here is gonna be in the global frame. So now we have a variable called unit and its value is one. And then we have a variable T and its value is three. And then we have a function called park. And then it takes in T and park and its parent equals global. I just basically referenced what goes right here. So now we call this function unit equals people park. So we need to evaluate this. So the function call will be people and the parent is the global frame, it's gonna call GF. And then it has what variable are within its scope. So people takes an S, so when you write in a value for S, in park, we define as a function. So this S is actually pointing to the function we defined here. We have the value unit, which is defined inside this method frame right here. So that equals two. And then we have a value for park. So we have this park and park goes S of unit T plus one. So what is S in this case? S is this function here. So we're gonna call park of, of unit t plus one because in this case s is still this function and we're calling it here so now i have to go to my next frame so basically every time you call a new function you have to go to a new frame so the next function is park and what function just called this it was the frame right above which is people oh wait, actually no oh shit that's a trick bro oh my god that's a i'm completely wrong the parent isn't the function that called it the parent is the stack frame where that function is defined so this s that we're using this function is defined in this frame right however our arrow here is pointing to this function here. And this function here is defined in global frame. So, so its parent's are actually global. So we had a variable S that points to a function, but that function itself was defined in global. So our actual parent is global. So we are passing it unit and T. So part takes in a T and takes in a part. So T and a part. And then our values that we had, it's from this call. So T equals unit. And where do we get unit? Unit we got from here. So T equals two. And then we want to check this T value. And then what's part? Part is the second value here. And that's T. T is not the T we have here. 
because that's the one that was defined in this scope, but the T that we're passing in for this parameter has to be in the scope above. So we have to go look at the parent. Does the parent have a T value? Parent is global frame, so now we're back here, and there is a T, so T equals three. So we're actually using this three value here. But do you all see like how kind of confusing this is getting? Like, my brain hurts, oh my God. So part equals three, and then what did we want to return? We wanted to return park of unit T plus one. So we're not done yet. So park returns unit minus two. What is unit? Unit we don't have to find here, so we have to go to our global again. So then unit equals one. So then what is one minus two? That's going to be negative one. So the return value is negative one. So negative one is our value for this function call right here, but then they also wanted to do plus one at the end. So then this value equals zero. And what is this value for? This value is for when we were calling this line right here. So park equals zero. So we finished that line and now we're on this line. So S now equals a new function. So now we're reassigning the value for S. S previously was pointed to this function part right here, but now we're reassigning it. So we want to take out this arrow. But basically we can erase this arrow right here because it no longer points to it. It equals lambda t part s. So the lambda function remember takes in a parameter. So in this case, the parameter is going to be s and it returns part. So it actually doesn't matter what parameter you're passing in because the return value doesn't use t at, doesn't use t at all. It just uses part. So basically this function is now just part. Or actually, I think we have to include lambda functions in our stack. Let's go back to the line we were on. Also, it's kind of like if you get lost in your train of thought, like you might get, like you actually might forget everything going on. You only remember what original line called this function. So you have to redo the whole thing. Let's go back. Okay, so this was originally pointing over here. And then now we went to this line where s equals lambda t part s. So I think we need to do is we have this lambda function that we call. So I'm just gonna draw in the lambda. Where was this called? This was called inside people and people is defined in F1. So our parent is F1. Then what is T in this case? T is equal to S. And what is S? S is the function that we have as park. So that means we're pointing to this original function now. So remember, if you don't have the variable S in your own scope, like within your frame, you have to go up to your parent. In this case, F3 doesn't have S. So then we have to go to its parent F1. So we check in F1 and F1 does have S defined, which was this arrow. So they're both pointing to the same value. So the T is defined as that. And then what do we return? We return park. And what is park in this case? A lambda T part is basically the same thing as a function where it's like def func that takes in T and then returns part. Like these two are equivalent. It's just a different way of writing. So we need to see what value is part. In this case, F3 doesn't have a value for part. So we go to its parent F1. Now we check the F1. Does F1 have a part? It does. It has a part right here. So I actually think I f***ed up initially before is because I didn't look at F1. I looked at the global frames value for part. So that's why I thought it was a function. So we're returning zero. So the return value is zero. And now you might've forgot, where did we originally call this function? Where are we passing this value zero to? It was in this line, S equals this. So now we know S equals zero inside this frame. Now I can take out this arrow and then we reassign its value to be zero. And then the last line we need to do is return lambda of abs unit. So the return value is a function, lambda doesn't take any parameters and then it returns absolute value of unit. And what is unit in this case? We first look at our current frame. Do we have a unit? Yes, we do. It's two. So we return the absolute value of two. Two is already positive. So we just return two. And that is it. Okay, so let's grade this question now. So first things first, let's just go frame by frame. So let's start with global frame. So unit equals one. Oh my. Unit equals, they say it's this function. You see this last line right here? Unit equals people park. So we did all the evaluation on the right side for people park, but I forgot to reassign the value for unit. Okay, so I forgot to do a lot of stuff, but we, I think that means we did the functionality right. Let's just see when I keep writing. Okay, so unit equals one. Nope, that's wrong. It's actually the function we defined. T equals three, that's correct. Park equals function, park T park global. Nice global frame, we're done. Let's go to F1. So frame equals global, S zero, unit two, park zero, return value function lambda at the end. Nice, okay, we got that. So then F2 right here, name is park, parent equals global, t equals two, park equals three, return value equals negative one. 
Okay, okay. Let's do the final frame with the Lambda. A Lambda pairing with F1. T points to function part T part. Okay. Return value zero. Not too bad. Not too bad. Not too bad. Let's do points. So this is eight points total. Then we have four frames. So each one's two points. And then I missed one value here. And there's four values. So you can just say it's 0 0.5 points for the unit. So we got 7.5 out of eight. And I think there's only two more questions after this. So this is going to be part one where I just finished the first half of this midterm.